No other monarch of England has made it to their platinum jubilee. They're going to be having events through the year, especially into June when her official birthday is celebrated and they'll have a big parade and everything. Ooh, I wish I could go to see that. But I'm going to put this one on the back burner because I've got to start saving up for her funeral. Because if there's any chance at all, I am going to those almost two weeks worth of activities in London. I have warned Shelly up at Presque Isle and Janelle keeps laughing every time I tell her this, but um, we're going to just make sure that she really, really knows this. I'm going to just go mention it to her again. You do know that since I started working here, I have said I have to go if, there, if when she dies. That'll be a sad trip. I know it will be. It. But you can't say I didn't give you warning. Okay. <laughs> I take it seriously. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> We're not gonna worry about that stuff. That's way off in the future. Now we've got time. Her mom lived to be like 101. She's got good genes. It's gonna be a while. As people are kind of coming in here, I will just do a little show and tell. Before the Queen passed away, they were switching to polymer banknotes in England, and that is plastic money. And here I am holding a 10 pound note. You can see on the upper left, the 10 and the 20 pound notes have little dots on them for people who are low vision. The five pound note, which is all I'm trusting you with, does not, <laughs> does not have dots, so then you know it's a five pound note. Interestingly enough, timing wise, before the queen passed away, they were having people exchange their paper bank notes. There was a deadline, I think it was, yesterday or something where you would not be able to use your paper bank notes in stores anymore i think you can still turn them into the bank but so they probably had a whole big run of queen elizabeth ii polymer bank notes and now they're all going to be charles but they're not going to replace these they're just going to replace them as needed in circulation so it'll be a while and i brought coins too just in case you haven't seen british coins and if you look closely you can see three different ages of the queen on the variety of coins that I have there. Other things that have to change, of course, the stamps. And this gets me because I do a little stamp collecting and the Machen series of stamps that was named after this gentleman at the bottom, uh, he, and I went to the Postal Museum because I'm that kind of person, and <laughs> he did a plaster cast of the queen. And this is it, I got to see it. That was pretty geeky neat and they took photographs of it in different lighting to result with this stamp image, which they've used since 1967 on the definitive stamp, which if you think about it in the US, like our flag stamps, those are definitive stamps. But in the UK, they've always used this image since 1967, but with different color backgrounds and different denominations on the stamps. And it would be one of the world's most reproduced pieces of artwork in the history of ever. And now that will change. So many things have to change. I was looking on the boxes of walkers back there and it says by order of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. So I mean everybody with a warrant, a royal warrant, is going to have to change their packaging even. There's so many things. Another postal thing would be the pillar boxes. They're not going to change them. But did you ever notice that, you can see me pointing out the initials that year to, uh, that the monarch who's the monarch at the time that the post box is put in, their initials, their uh, cipher goes on to the post box. So now Charles will have his, they just released his cipher. How many post boxes are actually going in these days anymore though? So I think they're probably taking more out. But anyway, this cipher will show up in other things around England as well, but just oh, so much that has to change now that the queen has passed away. So sure, anyway, we'll just start in a couple of seconds. Once I breathe and take another sip of water. I learned a lot about dehydration. You'll hear about that a little bit later. <laughs> all right, away we go. Thank you all very much for coming. This is great. Wow, I haven't seen some of you. Some of you are neighbors. Some of you are, I haven't seen ever, I think. Maybe, well, maybe. Um, but thank you. I appreciate it very much for coming. I really do. I'm going to calm down in a second here as we get going. The funny thing about this trip is, do you remember Florida, for those of you that know me, do you remember I was ticked off at the weather in, in Wisconsin and on a day when it was 90 degrees in the southern part of the state and it was still 80 here, I booked tickets to Florida. And I went, 
because I was looking for a place that had warm enough weather where I could wear shorts and it's got to be hot for that and where I could go swimming in the ocean and I actually did and I went to go the real goal was to see bioluminescent creatures on kayak tours and if you ever get the chance you absolutely have to do that it is absolutely wonderful and then I also tried to see Artemis launch mm, that still hasn't happened but I delayed my return from this trip because I was waiting for Artemis to launch, spent more money, Ugh. <sighs> and then I got home, and then this happened. This is CNN Breaking News. Uh, the Queen has died, um, very sadly, but all we know is the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. Um, which is horrific news for the nation, and I can only imagine how people feel watching this. You'll see that the flag over Buckingham Palace has been lowered. Um, I don't know quite what to say. I mean, this is the news we were dreading. Uh, I had gotten from, I work in Presque Isle on Thursday mornings, and my mom had called me and said the Queen wasn't well, and the people in Presque Isle found out I was crazy because I just lost my mind. And then I made it back to Mantrish Waters before the library opened, and I was watching CNN. I don't know why CNN, but the live feed on my computer when I saw that. And uh, that guy, I mean, he, he went on for a while like that where he just didn't know what to say. And I kind of felt like that. I couldn't form sentences. I was crying. My mom can testify. I called her on the phone. I was a mess. And I should not have made financial decisions that day either. You know how like after surgery they tell you not to? <laughs> after the queen dies, don't let Sarah make financial decisions. It's really, it's really too bad. I've, yeah, I don't want to dwell on that too much. <laughs> anyway, so I went to Florida. Here's how my September went. I didn't go anywhere for three years, and then I went everywhere in September. I got home on the 6th. I went back to work, you know, for a few days. The 7th, and the Queen passed away on the 8th, and I left for London on the 10th. It was 44 hours from the time I saw that CNN headline breaking news till the time I was driving out of the driveway to go to the airport to go to the funeral. <laughs> As it turned out, because she passed away in Scotland, I had a couple days leeway there, but again, don't make decisions when you're very emotional. But it was okay because I got to London and got to kind of walk around and see the lay of the land and see what all was going on in London. Because if you watched the funeral and all that stuff that went on during the week, you saw the precision of the people marching and all that, amazing. But you, you didn't see a lot of the stuff that went on that they had to build and put up and figure out through that 10 day time. It was just incredible. This is Hyde Park and you can see they were putting up the big screen TVs and sound system and then all those barricades, there were more and more barricades. Every barricade in all of England I think was in London and Windsor. And uh, 50,000 people I think were in Hyde Park for the funeral and there were a couple of other parks where they had big screens as well. Now, I can't tell you how many people have asked me about porta potties. <laughs> I guess, you know, it's a necessity. They were everywhere, you just didn't see them. I'll show you a shot from the official uh, video footage where you can actually see them, but you don't know you're seeing them. There were thousands everywhere. I got to London and I just felt like I had to go to Buckingham Palace and everybody in the universe felt that way too. So here I am standing in line for an hour and a half. Those are the people behind me waiting to get to Buckingham Palace. And they were controlling the flow of traffic very, pedestrian traffic very strongly. You can see we couldn't just cross the street anywhere. We had to go way up, come around, all those barricades. People were putting flowers there even though they weren't supposed to. And people everywhere. And if you look way across the courtyard here, those white tents, that's where the media was set up. So if you saw any of those headshots of the talking heads with the Buckingham Palace in the background, that's where they were shooting from. Once you got in there, they didn't really kick you out, so you could hang out there for a while. And they had, they had the flags going up, flags, 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 but see the black for the morning? I was there in 2016 for the Trooping of the Colors, and they had the flags up, but they didn't have the morning edition, additional things. Well, right off the bat, one of the side gates at Buckingham Palace opens, and somebody in the crowd says, William's supposed to be coming, so everybody rushed over there. Well, it turns out it wasn't William. Look very closely at the top of this shot. There's the police escort, and a car will be coming right here. You can't quite see it in this shot of mine, but there is the royal standard on this vehicle. People are yelling, God save the king, and that would be Charles. I was 
all right. First day in London, get to see the new king. And yes, it is weird to say King Charles. There he is, his very nice cufflink and bespoke suit, no doubt. I did have better royal sightings as the week went on, but that was a good start. <clears throat> So I was really tired, and I sat down against one of those barricades, and I fell asleep, and I woke up, and there's this lady on one side of me eating yogurt, and another lady on the other side of me eating a granola bar, Anne and Janet. I had a very delightful chat with them. Turns out they are part of Billy Graham's Rapid Response Ministry team, and Billy Graham has places, all organizations all over the world, and he actually had a friendship with the Queen. But what these people do, and I just mentioned this because uh, because uh, <laughs> because they go to places where people are emotional, which definitely there were emotional people there, and just kind of comfort them. And so we had a nice chat. One of them, Janet, was a librarian. They did a little bit of, you know, come to Jesus, but not bad. And then at the end, they said, do you want us to pray for you? And I'm thinking, well, I am half a world away in a giant city where there's going to be like a million extra people. Yeah, probably shouldn't turn down a prayer. So they said, well, what do you want us to pray for specifically? And I said, well, my mom has lost a child and she can't lose another. So I would like a prayer for getting home safely. And they did. And when I drove in the driveway after this whole adventure was over, driving into the driveway on the way back from the airport, I said a thank you to Janet and Ann. So I just wanted to um, mention that. <laughs> and I didn't get their surnames or anything. I just, I'm gonna have to write a letter to the rapid response team. From Buckingham Palace, I walked down towards Westminster to see what was going on there. And if you see the picture on the bottom, that is across the street from Westminster. You never saw it on television. Why? Because that turned into the stands or whatever scaffolding for the media coverage. And so, of course, it couldn't just be scaffolding like in the first picture. No, no, they had all this plywood put on and they literally painted it tan so that it would blend into everything. Stuff like that happened everywhere, all over London. It was crazy. Westminster Abbey was closed. They announced the funeral, said, please don't leave flowers here. Take them to Green Park. More on flowers later. Meanwhile, the Queen's coffin was still up in Scotland, and they did lying in state in a service up there. I thought about going up there, but I figured I'd get stuck up there and wouldn't be able to make it back, so I did. Hey, look, barricades in Scotland. Okay, I lied. They weren't all in London and Windsor. Ha! But on the 14th, the Queen's coffin was brought back to London, the Royal Air Force Base, outside of London, transferred to a hearse, and brought into the city. And they announced the route that it would come through. And so I was out there standing on the street. That was the only time I had to stand in the rain. And this gentleman came up to me and said, can I interview you? And I'm like, for what? And <laughs> he's like, I work for the Times. Uh-huh. He gave me his card and he interviewed me. And is Pat Stonehouse here? She said, of course you would get interviewed. <laughs> I had always told my employers I would leave if the queen passed away. So I booked my tickets and told them I'd be going. And hopefully I have a job when I get back. <laughs> hey, it turns out that was uh, the Times, which goes out to 400,000 people every day. Oh. Not bad. <laughs> Make him press in the UK. This, it, it was, that was during the day, and then it gradually got dark, and funnily enough, I was standing next to people from Appleton, Wisconsin, that was weird, but the gal on the other side of me was watching the footage live on her phone from the airport, so we could kind of see how long it was taking to get into the city, and it was raining, and Anne, it, Princess Anne was the one who accompanied the coffin into the city, and it, and she didn't have an umbrella, and the gal next to me, who was from England, she said, oh, Anne, she's hearty. <laughs> no umbrella for her. <laughs> or brawly, I can't remember what she said. But anyway, that was, that was nice, I liked that, because Anne is hearty. So this is an aerial view from a helicopter. This is the official video feed you would have seen if you'd watched online. Here's the motorcade, here is the hearse right here, and I am standing right here. These people are rushing up here. I didn't even notice at the time. I'm right here. Uh, Anne was in a car, not this one, but the one behind that. You'll see that in another shot. Oh, not that one. I guess it was the one after that. Evening. By that time, it was evening. It was still raining. So this is in London. They carried on that way. Hyde Park would be right over here, if you're familiar, and then carried on down towards 
Buckingham. I did not notice these people rushing. I was so intent on what was going on on the street. And they really didn't shut down traffic much. I thought there'd be this big pause in traffic and we'd be ready, prepared for when this was going to go by. But they, those little police motorcycles kind of just stopped across traffic and were like, halt! And then all of a sudden the coffin was there. It was amazing. This was the moment where I kind of went, I'm here. This is crazy. And this is my footage. My footage is not that great because I was just holding the camera out and watching with my eyes. This, this is real time. I mean, like, look how fast that happened. It was crazy. I waited for hours and then bam, it was over. Yes. So it was very dramatic with the dark sky and then the very bright LED. Um, that's Anne going by there. See the Bobby bowing? I'll talk more about that later. There's a shot of me. I'll talk more about that later. The next day at 2.22 p.m., precisely. They were going to march from Buckingham to Westminster Hall where the lying in state was going to take place. I got up at five and walked out and around down the length of this where they were going to have the procession for this. By the time I got to this barricade, it was 7.30 and that's where I stood until about three o'clock in the afternoon. It was a lot of standing. So just to get a lay of the land, Buckingham Palace is here. The Mall, that red street that you see on all the scenes from the funeral and everything that's here then they went across horse guards which is where trooping the colors happens big open gravel area and then they made a, a turn and went straight down to westminster hall so i am the green dot i don't know why i'm looking crabby over here but whatever <laughs> but this this gives you an idea of the area where i saw them come through and see all these people in high vis jackets can you see them all the way down those were security event security people but then and you can see them all on the back side there too zillions zillions of them and then zillions of police officers too and if i forget to mention it later notice what they're wearing today for this procession they're wearing their full get up of gear but for the funeral they were wearing their dress blues this is not my video this is the official feed you would have seen if you'd watched it on any network because all the official feeds were the same which is why i'm only on like one shot <laughs> so this is crossing horse guards a big open gravel area i'm along this side of it look closely for the porta potties it was very dramatic people did applaud not like wild crazy but i just don't i think they didn't know what to do i'm standing right here by this white flag and so those people did march that whole route which is a mile something it was incredible i mean those some of those people are not spring chickens so then from here, if you, you'll notice right across the top, there's an archway, a stone archway. They went through the stone archway and then made that corner and down Whitehall towards Westminster Hall. I'm right here. And the sun came out like just as they rounded the corner and everything was just super bright. It was really neat. Which for England, that's kind of amazing. That's the official footage. And then uh, this is this is mine, my point of view. Just to, And again, not great, because I'm just basically pointing the camera and, and watching the procession as it goes by with my, my own eyes. That crown, amazing. R real diamonds, wow, makes a difference. <laughs> Who knew? Right, and on the, on, the, on the official feed, you got kind of the same audio over and over because that's what they were getting piped in, but you would get kind of these like lulls in the music between the different bands that came by. It was really interesting. So there goes the royal family and lots of other people. And then uh, just one last time, this is that official shot, porta potties right here behind curtains. That's where I am. Do you wonder how they got this shot? Check, check this out. This guy, like a real live guy up on a little tiny platform way 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 up high he's higher than the buildings 
He's higher than the snipers on top of the buildings. Not the job for me. Nope. Crazy. Crazy. The procession went by. They're still heading down to Westminster Hall a little bit. I've, I'm trying to decide, should I go to the lying in state? Because that was going to start at 5.30. I'd been standing since 5 in the morning. My back was killing me. I have a bad back. I mean, it was, it was a long, long day. And I thought, should I go now or, you know, like tomorrow's fine, right? Turns out, mm -mm, I'm so glad I went that day. So I started heading this direction to Lamberth Bridge, which is where you were supposed to go for the queue. But because the... This was one thing that wasn't, didn't work like clockwork. The pedestrian traffic, like you saw with the Buckingham Palace, where they made you go down a couple blocks before you could cross and come back, that happened all over the place, but it seemed like you could walk six blocks and then cross where that guy told you to cross back six blocks ago, but now they've closed that or you can't actually get across there. So it was a lot, a lot of extra walking. Um, so I got to the corner of this area where I was and kind of got trapped for a while because they weren't letting people go. But as it turns out, this time was because the bands were leaving from the procession that way. Much snappier, peppier tune on the way back. And then all the royal cars went by too. But I was pretty claustrophobic because I, I was literally in a corner of a building area there. Ugh. But it was kind of neat to see the procession go again. Eventually, they finally let us out of this area. People were kind of clambering to go a little vocally. I felt like I was walking in circles, made it across Lamberth Bridge, and the queue was miles down that side of the river. You had to pass by the London Eye and the Clank and the Globe Theater. And this was also just one thing that wasn't quite perfection as far as planning. They made you walk all the way to the end of the queue, even though at this time the queue wasn't full. Later you probably heard stories about the queue to the queue, and it's because the queue was full, but at this point it wasn't. But they still made you walk all that way to get a wristband, and then walk all the way back. So, <laughs> it was a lot of walking. Got my wristband though. Oh, you bet. As a matter of fact, at this point, we were walking pretty quickly. I was feeling pretty good about things. Passing by. This is a parliament and Big Ben behind me. And I have my wristband. It says on here, it does not guarantee entry, but we'll see what happens. We're getting much closer than we were before and moving quite rapidly. Yeah, that moment's in time. <laughs> But it was not that fast all the time. We would stop, we would stand, we would start, we would go. And I'm by myself. I do have to say that if you end up in a situation like this, I can't imagine another situation like this, but go with somebody because you need to have somebody hold your place in line so that just, just, just for a moment, just somebody else to watch your stuff, just somebody. <laughs> but um, I don't know anybody else as crazy as me, so I don't know who would have gone with me to this. But. <laughs> We're crossing the, crossing the river, and then we're feeling pretty good about life in the line, and then we hit this section here, the snakes. People were calling them the snakes, and it was like a line from Disney World hell or something, and you ended up in this section, which this was the first day, so people didn't know this was coming. I think later, because it showed up on the papers, people yeah. knew, but this was soul-crushing. You can see I look a little soul-crushed at this point. <laughs> And they were also threatening to take your water away. And at one point before you got to the snakes, they, they said, all right, remember, no water, no food. And so I got all nervous and I did something rash. There's a couple of checkpoints ago, they told us they were gonna take our, the rest of our food and water away. So I got rid of the rest of my food and then I drank almost all the rest of my water. And now we hit this section of the queue. Whoops, I may have been a little hasty drinking all that water. <laughs> tragedy waiting to happen. Fortunately, no tragedy, but I also didn't go to the bathroom because I had nobody to hold my place in line. I'm sure I have more kidney stones to prove uh, that I was there. But so that was really a lot. And this was one of two days, I think, the whole trip where my data was working on my iPad and mom was watching the live feed of 
the lying in state. And she watched so many hours because I'd be like, I'm getting close. No, it's going to be a while. No, we're moving fast. I mean, and you can't just like go and do something else while you're watching the lying in state. You have to watch all these people going through there if you want to catch your daughter going through half a world away. Also at that time, somewhere in here, I realized I'm never going to find myself if I watch all these hours, because it was four days, all these hours of the live stream. I'm never going to find myself after the fact. Mom doesn't know how to do the recording of the screen, but Callie, she's my hero. I got a hold of her, and she had just, for some random reason, refreshed her memory on how to screen record, and she was going home, she brought up the live feed, and recorded me going through and so I have that as a memento of this trip seriously hero of the day and so I had a cheerleading section and her mom too who across the world as I went through in live time which was kind of comforting as well because I was really struggling at this point it was getting cold I'd been on my feet since five in the morning and I was I, it was tough I am this is really special to me. This is from what Callie recorded. And it's so special that I kind of almost don't want to share it, but you guys are special because you came. And so I'm going to show you like 20 seconds of the lying in state, and I'm going to talk about it for a little while. Sorry if it doesn't interest you, but this was really the thing that was the most emotional for me for the whole trip, even the funeral. Um, we had to go through airport security. I had to take all my layers of clothing off because I was standing there in the cold. I had all these layers, but I told mom and Callie, I'm wearing gray. So I had to get my jacket back on and we make it into the hall finally, but we're standing behind this kind of wall se segment here. And I had not done my research, which for me is really weird. I hadn't watched like the, the Queen Mother's lying in state or anything. I didn't know the layout of this room. And before we get in there, I'm thinking, why am I doing this? I, what, for like two seconds? What are we, what, are, what am I gonna see? And feeling, feeling just, oh, it, it was a tough day. We get in there and we're behind the wall and I'm thinking, ah, oh, we have to wait in here too? And <laughs> I'm dropping my vest to try to get my jacket back on and we're shuffling along because I'm in line and we clear this pillar here and I look down the length of the room. I tell you, actually I have chills right now. It, it, it was amazing. You're standing up on those stairs looking down and I know the rest of the room is kind of brown and beige but it was like the rest of the world faded away and that whole center section was just brilliantly bright. It was incredible. I am in the green circle there. I am facing the coffin right at this moment. It's a good thing you can't see my expression because I'm sure I just look completely dazed. It's just amazing. So I am in this shot right here. Yes, thank you, Callie, again. That was amazing, there I am. Um, I mean, look how close you get. And those, those gentlemen in their bright uniforms even, just so stock still were so imposing. And the colors on the Royal Standard and the crown, and just, oh. I walked the length of the room, actually, because you, you can't see it after that on the live feed, live stream. You walk the rest of the length of the room, the large open doors at the end to the outside world, and people were kind of slowly going and crying. Grown men were crying, people were crying. They were kind of standing just outside the door looking back. There was somebody from Westminster who was saying to almost every single person, thank you for coming, like really sincerely, thank you for coming. And that just really struck me. And I walked the length of the room, and I looked back through those doors, and I cleared the door frame. Oh, it was just, I walked out of there and I thought to myself, would I do that again? Mm -hmm. In a moment, mm -hmm. yeah. I talked to some people at the funeral who had been in line for 14 hours, and I asked them, would you do it again? And they said, absolutely. Like everybody who went through that line said, absolutely, they would do it again. Mm -hmm. I am glad I went the first day, because after that, the line time was astronomical. David Beckham, he won props for standing in line for 12 hours, the soccer star. Mm -hmm. Like normal people, because you couldn't get to jump the queue. Everybody had to go through the line if you were going to go through the line. The MPs didn't get to skip the line. Anybody want to guess how many hours, not counting all the time it took me to walk to the end of the queue, how long I was in line? 
not as long as you would guess, but it sure seemed like a long time. It was six hours and 38 minutes. I made it through the lying in state and had a couple of days, so I decided the day before the funeral to go to Windsor because I knew I wasn't going to get into the castle, but I wanted to see what was going on down there. More guards, more barricades. It was a little more laid back than London, but it was a lot of people there as well. Gorgeous day. They had the flags out. Of course. Now, here is what you would have seen on television if you watched the funeral and the Windsor portion of it. This is part of the long walk. This is where the people ended up standing on the grass here. These are camera stands, this green curtain hiding them. Oh, porta potties. They don't have their curtains in front of them yet. I got a day to do that. Here is that gate that on the funeral, when they're marching the long walk and they go through the gate and then there are all those flowers on the lawn, that's right here. I'll show you a shot of that from the funeral later. That was right near where the floral tribute in Windsor was. And the sign says that they were going to keep everything for the royal family. Not like they're going to sit down and read them because there's millions, but I thought that was an interesting touch. So here is that gate and those flowers just starting there on the lawns back that away for the procession up to the castle. I do want to spend a minute talking about window displays because this was incredible. I mean every single store no matter what kind of store it could be eyeglasses, Samsung, TGI Fridays, they had something in their windows honoring the Queen. It was really truly incredible. A lot of places had something simple from we're gonna be closed for the funeral to here's something stuck up with poster putty on the right hand side. You know whatever works but every place had something especially in Windsor. It was incredible. These are clothing stores that had displays, fresh flowers. This on the left was a, in the lobby of a hotel. Every sort of business. This was a photography place. This was in my neighborhood. This one was really striking in person. Very neat. And I think, I hope there was a photographic journalist that took pictures of a lot of this stuff because that was part of the whole experience, I think. People were just trying to find a way to express their sorrow. This was at the Postal Museum, and of course they had a whole sheet of those Machen stamps out. The first edition. Just everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. And different pictures that people found, and different ages, and different ways to express. This was a couple of theaters in London, where Greece is playing, and a movie theater. This is in Piccadilly Circus on one of those giant digital screens. And then some places chose to have nothing in their windows as a sign of respect. Fortnum and Mason is the Queen's grocer. I won't get into why that's a designation. But as a sign of their respect, they kept their windows covered. And then Barber chose to do that too, saying that they've been proud and honored to hold a royal warrant. That's a special designation too I won't go into. Marks and Spencer, same thing. So instead of showing clothing of the week, which this is Marks and Spencer shirt, by the way, I got in London. It's my big splurge. They chose to show nothing as a sign of respect. A couple people were already God save the king. I was, I'm not there yet. <laughs> not there. Need some time. This place had hand-painted signs on either side of their pub door. One for the queen, one for the new king. This one, can you tell what this is? When you know what it is, it's so neat. So look closely. I looked this guy up and you should too. Snowwindows.com. Tom Baker. Do you know how like when you flock, you do with those flocking pictures and you put a template up and you spray the flocking and then you take the template off? Nuh-uh. This guy sprays the window and then with a paintbrush, he removes the excess to create these images and he did one for the queen. Incredible. And then this is kind of a unique one too. <laughs> Tops of post boxes. And apparently this was a thing during COVID people were doing, so it makes a little bit more sense in context. Somebody did, did a couple for the queen. Look at her little handbag. Aww. Every website I went to was honoring the queen in some way with a banner at the top. Google, I don't know what they did in this country, but the days leading up to the funeral, they grayed out their logo on the day of the funeral. They did it in black. Yahoo was doing black as well. Every website had something going on. I don't know how any florist in all of London had any flowers left because I think they were all in the park. And this was something that surprised me. I, I didn't know this would move me as much until I went there. And I ended up going there three times, I think, because it was just so unique and something I probably will never see again. This is a part of it. This is in Green Park, which is near 
Buckingham Palace, and they wanted people to bring stuff here rather than have it in front of Buckingham Palace because those first few days they were just inundated with flowers. And I mean, it was like as far as you could go up to your knees and live flowers, but mostly cut flowers, but so many personal messages. It was, look at all that. Oh my gosh. Oh, this was interesting. This was like the equivalent to FTD florist. And I was wondering what kind of address do you put on there? There were a whole bunch of these. Green Park, the Queen's Memorial. I don't know. I'm sure they put something into their logarithms, but I thought that was interesting that people sent flowers if they couldn't be there. Lots of, the kids ones really tore me up. Lots of corgis, lots of little corgi pictures. This one is Queen Elizabeth walking her corgis on a windy day. I didn't make that up, it says that up here. And I love you and I'll miss you. I mean, come on. I'm like crying all the way through the park. And not just kids, adults with handwritten, personalized messages to your majesty, fancy handwriting. Who handwrites anything anymore uh, in foreign languages? Just gobs. You could spend hours there just reading notes. This one, two different members of the family took time to write individual messages. It's just, I hope somebody recorded a lot of these too. This one, although we feel orphans, like they've lost parents. And people were trying to put flowers anywhere. They just felt like they needed to. This was a war memorial, but it has Queen Elizabeth's name on it, so people were just putting stuff there. Just anywhere and everywhere. And then grief is the price we pay for love, her quote from after 9-11. And okay, so Paddington Bear, let's just take a moment to talk about that. That became quite the deal and actually quite the problem. It came about because for the Platinum Jubilee, have you seen this? YouTube it, it's very cute with the Queen and Paddington Bear. And then the day she passed away, this came out, or practically everybody saw it. And they were begging people not to bring any more Paddington Bear stuffed critters or marmalade sandwiches. <laughs> this is in Paddington Station, train station, with the brass Paddington Bear and people were leaving stuff there, including a marmalade sandwich. <laughs> everywhere, stuff was everywhere. I thought I had taken a picture of it, but I couldn't find it. One of them said something about, um, one of the notes at the floral tribute, something about, I hope you're happy with Philip in heaven, and if you see my dad, say hi. Aww. I'm telling you, I was crying like every two feet in the floral tribute. Alrighty, here we are, the funeral, the reason you came, the reason I came. Long procession route, she's lying in state in Westminster Hall. They take her to Westminster Abbey. That's where the funeral was, if you watch this. Then they marched up Whitehall, across that big open gravel place where I was for the last procession, down the mall to Buckingham Palace and Wellington Arch. I got up at midnight, yep, and started walking towards Wellington Arch. I'm like, I'm standing there. And they wouldn't let you. I got yelled at, actually, by a police officer. And, um, no, you can't stand here. So then I got a little panicky and I was like high-tailing it. And again, you have to go like back and forth, back and forth because they won't let you just go in a straight line. Up to the mall, the mall people are camping. It's like four people deep. I'm thinking, holy cow, I'm gonna end up at the park watching this on big screen. I came to London to watch it on big screen. And then I, they weren't letting anybody stand at that time in horse guards. So I ended up on Whitehall and I wasn't even in the front row. I was behind people with a tent, but at least the tent wasn't as tall as me. And I thought, well, I can see over the tent. Well, eventually they made, made everybody take their tents down. And the very nice Irish people that had the tent let me scooch up to the front. So I was in the front for the funeral. So very nice Irish people. I have a sleeping bag from them too, actually. <laughs> Here I am on the streets of London at about 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> The funeral procession was at noon, by the way. Here we are, it's now daylight. Notice these columns in the back and this building. You'll see them in the official shot if you look quickly. That's where I'm standing. The royal party goes towards Westminster and we got to see them go by. The royal standard on the car, so that's the king. So then in the official footage, when they showed that, I did find myself in one extra shot. There I am. <laughs> Next to this 
flag that the Irish people brought. I'm still wearing my vest and holding up my, my camera. And there's my head right there. <laughs> Honest to goodness, it's me. They were piping the funeral on loudspeakers down the street of London where I was. And all these people had been chatting and, and visiting and meeting new lion buddies, I call them, because it was a phenomenon I saw over and over again. People were perfect strangers after you stand next to them for six or seven hours. You're great friends. I got a sleeping bag from the Irish people. I mean, come on. <laughs> they were piping the audio from the funeral down the streets of London, and the whole crowd of people that had been talking and chatting were just silent. And when the funeral started and the choir started to sing, I mean, it was goosebumps. And I can't play that audio for you to avoid copyright problems if you're watching this online. But trust me, goosebumps. It was so angelic. It was something. People were telling me that actually Windsor was more moving that part of the service than this. But for me, just hearing it down the streets of London was pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. And I couldn't even see it. I started to feel really sick though, and this does color the memories of this day for me because I almost fainted. I've never almost fainted in my life, but I did that day. I was dehydrated. I'd been on my feet for six plus hours and didn't eat, eat salt because I thought I'd have to drink water and I did everything wrong. And I almost fainted to the point where police officers were rushing towards me and paramedics asking if I needed help. And I'm like, no, I don't want help. I was thinking they were going to take me away and I was going to miss the whole thing. The nice Irish people were like, do you need sweeties? Do you need crisps? Do you need water? I said, no, I think I'm going to throw up. They're like, do you want a trash bag? <laughs> they gave me a trash bag. I still have it. I didn't have to use it. Thank goodness. But I, my vision went white. I had, I was like headed for the ground. It was scary. I just, I'd never had that happen. So I didn't know what was happening. I recovered in time to listen to the rest of the funeral. And then, of course, so I'm highly emotional, which also doesn't help with fainting. Um, then they get to the national anthem with the queen's coffin right there. And they're singing God Save Our King. Oh, like I'm a mess. That song is going to mess me up for the rest of my life. Watch, watch this next shot. Who's not singing? For 70 years, the only person who didn't have to sing the national anthem was the queen. She would stand in the middle of everybody singing to her, and now it's Charles. Oh, too much. Too much. Very emotional day for me. The funeral ended and they started the procession and the procession was so long I didn't even see the beginning of it because it was way down almost by Buckingham Palace which is what this shot is here's the Queen Victoria Fountain and Buckingham Palace would be right in the foreground the like for example the Royal Canadian Mountain and whoever's never saw them they were way past me where they lined up for the procession which is okay because I saw a lot of stuff but the funny thing about why my mother couldn't even find me in any of the shots is because for most of the time the official live footage is showing the royal mounted canadian yahoos gosh darn them i'm sure they're lovely and their mothers love them and um but they were showing this shot during the time when the the coffin was going right by where i was standing so i'm in like two frames which is fine but anyway i just find that amusing here we go this is the official footage you would have seen if you watched the funeral procession. Here's the royal family, Anne, got Harry, William, Charles. I'm behind, right here's that white flag. Here I am. And there's a coffin there. And it was precision itself. When these Navy guys started coming down the, the street and I could see them, and I knew they were the ones carrying the coffin on the gun carriage. Oh. I'm telling you, this was an amazing day. So now they're turning that corner into horse guards across that open gravel area where I had been for the procession the other day. And the guns and Westminster chiming and... So there I am, and there's, there's a coffin. And then this would be my footage. Again, not great, because I was not looking at my camera. I was looking at what was going on. Coffin, the Navy guys. Here's a camera guy. I 
heard that several of these people fainted too, but they had like reason. I was just standing still. See the Bobby in his dress blues today and his head bowed. I'll talk about why in just a minute. Not something I'll ever see again. I'm not going for Charles, just in case you wanted to ask that question. <laughs> so they had a lot of guys on the front, but they had a lot of guys on the back for breaks too. And then the royal family, you'll see them coming up right in here now. And then uh, just so like I said we missed the beginning of the procession but it didn't matter because after this there were still so many bands so many horse horse processions here's another one of those really tall cameras and the Bobbies only had a whistle so they couldn't really do much as far as defending but don't worry there were guys with automatic weaponry everywhere too You can just see the royal cars now coming on the right hand side. Everybody was already looking at them. If you see here, here are my Irish people. They're already looking at the royal cars coming down the street, but I'm looking as it rounds a corner, the coffin. I know it's ridiculous. She's gone. She's in a box. I can't see her, but I was thinking, I really was thinking at that moment. I'm like, this is it. This is the last time I'm ever seeing the queen. Oh. This gal, she's my Irish gal too. She's annoyingly texting, but look at her thumbs. They're like vibrating. She's super emotional too, you can tell. And so then those are the royal cars. Um, and I have another shot of that, but William, or not William, Kate and the kids, the adorable kids, everybody talked about, there they are right there in that little jump seat. And then Kate and then Camilla's on the far side of this car. And, uh, then we had Megan, and who was she with? Sophie? I can't remember. And then uh, Beatrice and Eugenie, or however you say her name, were in the following car after that. And all sorts of other royally type people. Lots to see. Watch this guy. He does his salute and bow very properly. And the day of, if you think back to when the coffin was coming into the city, that night shot and the guy was bowing, on their little uh, radios, they were being told, bow your head when the procession comes by. And then because they didn't have their radios on and their dress blues, their superiors were coming by and telling each one of them how to hold their hands because they had their gloves on that day too, and to bow when the procession came by as a sign of respect. And so they were all like super tense. They kept like sneaking peeks because they also weren't supposed to be looking, but they kept sneaking peeks to make sure that they could bow at the right time so I thought that was very interesting as a sign of respect. They march back around Buckingham Palace to Wellington Arch, Wellington Arch then along the park and then out to Windsor and at Wellington Arch they switched from the uh, what you saw there to the hearse and here's another just a little bit of look at that this was the day before the funeral I was by Wellington Arch thinking I was gonna stand in this area silly me I should have known because they put sod in there that is too good for me that would have to be for the royalty. So imagine the shot with the dead brown grass that was there two days before. Heavens no. So they put in sod for the royal family to stand on for this shot. Found that interesting. I stayed put for two hours drinking water and eating snacks, so I felt better. But also because I knew they weren't going to let us out of that area. By the time I got back to where I was staying, I got to watch the, the part of the procession in Windsor. So this is that long walk now where I had the picture the other day. All these people, the cameras in the green along the side, the procession going down towards the castle. There are all those flowers on the lawn. Oh and her horse and groom. I don't even like horses. I'm crying about the horse. <laughs> crying about the corgis. I don't even like corgis. <laughs> her corgis are there. I mean, come on. I was crying all the rest of this whole thing. Did you wonder what was up with the stick and the breaking of the stick? They did talk a little bit about it, but the Lord Chamberlain, he's the most senior position in the royal household. This symbolizes the end of his service to the monarch, like that's it, you're done. 
And so that was very symbolic. And of course they took the crown and the scepter and the orb off. That was a lot. And then, so that she returns to the grave as a normal human being. And then they read all of her titles one last time. This mighty as she's going and into the most crypt. excellent monarch, Elizabeth II, head of the Commonwealth, defender of the faith, and sovereign of the most noble order of the garter. And then bagpipes. Bagpipes get me on the best of days. How about you? Crying. And then that's her bagpiper, and he exits, and it fades off into the distance. Yeah, very much so. So we're getting towards the, we're getting to the end. I mean, that was the end of the funeral. That's why I went to London. I unfortunately booked my tickets too far out, so I didn't come back until the 23rd, but it was kind of okay because I had a little bit of downtime to, I mean, it was very emotional. I'm terrible at compartmentalizing emotions as in I can't. It was very, a lot, a lot for me. And so I'm kind of glad that I had a couple days to sort of decompress. And I actually don't think I will until after I do this presentation in Presque Isle, because I've been so, like, looking at my pictures and everything and reliving everything. But um, I picked up the paper the day after the funeral. And I do have papers up here that you're welcome to look at. I picked up papers. They had free papers and almost every day by the underground. And so I tried to pick them up because they just had amazing uh, visual images, you know, that I wanted to remember. You're welcome to look at those. Uh, to leave you on a lighter note, I did do other stuff in England, but I'm not talking about that because we're out of time. But I did do some fun things, including eating custard tarts and stuff like that. And I did go on a day trip and up to the York area and stuff. You know, had, had some lighter moments too. Anyway, I don't usually do questions, but I thought some of you might have some in like specific questions that I didn't think to ask. Yes, Susie. Um, what inspired you to be so interested, so fascinated, so in love? You obviously love the Queen and England. And what inspired you? And how long has this been going on? How long has this affliction? Um, yes, <laughs> that is the million dollar question, Susan. I knew somebody was going to ask, and as a matter of fact, that guy on the street from the Times asked me that question. I don't have a good answer, though. It's, this, it's the most boring story. I always have. Why do you like the Packers? You know, some people have the Packers and are emotionally involved. I don't remember the beginning. It's been that long. I don't know. I think that I've made choices just, just I've made choices in my life just for my employment, let's just say, as we all have had pretty much the opportunity to do so. Are they good choices? I don't know. But I made those choices. She didn't get a choice, and she had to toe that line for 70 plus years, and I just find that phenomenal. And I, I just was always very respectful of that situation, and so I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer to that question. I wish I had a better snappy story because it's just always, always been. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, sorry. Be back. You first. Um, Good to see you. you seriously. Um, you showed that cameraman up, you know, higher than the snipers. Were there uh, were the drones disallowed? There... Drones were not allowed, and no air craft was allowed to go except for the official helicopter and, like, for the the evening into the city thing, that was all done by one helicopter and one really good camera person. And as a matter of fact, I meant to mention during, during the two minutes of silence, they did not even let commercial air flight go from Heathrow so that it was absolutely silent. And it was for those two minutes. The only thing I heard were crows down the street having a little conversation. That was it in London. Wow. Amazing. So yeah, no drones. Yes, Leisha. Do you have anything you can try to tell me that you took this entire thing? Do you know? I wish I had had one of those Fitbits or whatever to find out. And I also want to know how many, so she asked about how many steps I took, and then how many hours total I was standing. I would love to know that, too, because it was more than I've stood in my whole entire life, I think. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm curious about your travel arrangements. You were able to get a flight uh, on the last minute and then a hotel as well. <laughs> Yes, the question is flight and hotel. Remember about that not making decisions when you're emotional? <laughs> I got a flight. I had been earmarking some miles for it. It did not cover it, but I knew this was what I was going to do. And the other thing, though, finding a place to stay, I was not 
in an emotional place to do that. Um, it was a flat, which was kind of okay, but kind of gross. The building and the neighborhood were fine, but it was dirty. The kitchen, which was this fully functional kitchen, no. And it had like one pot and a pan with meat juices on it. And it had a syringe in the refrigerator door. I'm hoping that wasn't like recreational and more like diabetes, but still it was there. Not the best choice of my life. But my mom required a place with a locking door and I couldn't sleep on a park bench. So I, that, was the, that was the rule. Mm -hmm. Kelly, did you have a question? Yes, I was looking at your boxes and so I wanted to know about your grocery store experience. Oh, What's your favorite grocery store, Sarah? You're hilarious, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly has inside information on the fact that I went grocery shopping every single day. I told my mom there must be a 12-step program for this. <laughs> I love British snacks. They're so much fun. I went and looked at every kind of potato crisp. It's a, it's a thing in our family, though. Every flavor, every kind of... I like baking stuff. Have you watched British baking? And they're using all these crazy ingredients you've never heard of. I went to Waitrose and had to go look at the baking section. Yogurt. Best yogurt in the world is in England. I don't know what my favorite was. They're all delightful. Go to Waitrose. Go to M&S. Go to Tesco. Go to Sainsbury's. Thank you all very much for coming. It really means a lot to me that you cared enough to want to hear more about it.